Good morning and welcome to Cyber Hygiene. I am Thomas Deere, the Vice President of Sales and Engagement at the Chamber, and I have the privilege of being your host today. Today is the first of a four-part series on cybersecurity presented in partnership with our partner, Oswald Companies. Cybersecurity is an evolving risk that poses a threat to businesses of all sizes. Nobody is immune. Expert estimate that ransomware attacks occur every 11 seconds. Just think about that, every 11 seconds. If you're not already, you should be considering a cybersecurity risk plan for your company, which can help cover the cost of financial burden for paying ransom, lost profits along with the concerns from business interruption from a cyber breach. Today, we are joined by two partners who are experts. Lacey Rex of Oswald Companies and David Goodwin of Advanced Technology Consulting. They have joined forces to share more about the risks, how you can combat them, and what your options are for liability solutions. Lacey Rex is the Vice President of Cyber Strat Strategic Leadership from Oswald Companies. Oswald is a full service risk management firm focused on proactive insurance brokerage partnership. They provide property and casualty insurance, including emerging risks, along with employee benefit programs. By living their core values of passion for excellence, integrity, resourcefulness, commitment community, they are a leader in the industry with a 97% retention rate. We'll also hear from David Goodwin, the managing partner and co-founder of Advanced Technology Consulting. He's a proud alumnus of Leadership Cincinnati, class of 38 and a leader in our CEO roundtables. David has more than 30 years of information technology and telecommunication experience and specializes today in voice, network, cloud, and cybersecurity. David and his company recently signed a new 10-year lease to build out a state-of-the-art office for technology and collaboration to accommodate ATC's growth. It's my pleasure to introduce Lacey Rex and David Goodwin. Lacey? Hi, good morning. I'm just going to be sharing my screen. So I would say we'll start the webinar. If there's any questions, please let us know. Um, I think this is something that we wanna be helpful for everybody. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to just put those in the chat and we'd be happy to answer those. Um, you know, today we're planning on talking about the threat landscape, um, cybersecurity controls, best practices, and what the carriers are expecting at this time. And then also we'll talk briefly about transferring the risk, but that's more to come in the rest of the series. So today, uh, you know, Obviously, we see these um, things happening in the news all the time, but um, the average the average cost has actually increased. It was a little over three million um, and some change, and now it's roughly four point two four million, I believe, is the average um, cost of data breach last year. Um, and the largest ransomware uh, payout this year, the extortion itself, was forty million dollars that was paid by an insurance company. So. We're setting a lot of records, but not necessarily in the best direction. And um, this next slide is really more of a, um, just a visual of what the cyber crime ecosystem really looks like. So this is a CrowdStrike um, 2021 global threat reports. And you can see, um, you don't necessarily have to be a technical person to really um, get involved in cyber crime. There's a software as a service and there's also buying crime as a service as well. So you can actually purchase these malware on dark web. You don't have to have any kind of expertise. Um, so, and then obviously the goal is to distribute it and then try and monetize it. So there's um, Bitcoin scramblers and all kinds of things that can actually make the money be anonymized. Um, so, you know, obviously cyber crime is a thriving um, thriving eco economic um, way of obviously generating any kind of income for these cyber criminals. A lot of nation states, they're in um, places like Russia, 
China, et cetera, and it's a revenue generator. And obviously cybercrime is much more approachable and uh, a lot easier than having you know, traditional crime. So we're seeing just huge increase in this space. I'm gonna turn this slide over to David to chat about. Uh, thanks so sometimes. Thank you. First of all, Thomas, thank you for the introduction. Lacey, thanks for transferring this over. Uh, I think for a lot of people seeing is believing this is kind of one of those slides here. Not that we really want to get deep into the weeds, but it speaks to the whole ecosystem that Lacey was talking about before. So on the left hand side, uh, you, I don't have control here, but all the way to the left in the yellow circles, you see whether that's email or attachments. It can hit different devices. It could be through links. I think we all kind of know that to a certain degree. But then you have these bad actors kind of sitting out there, all of them trying to hit you in different ways. And then eventually, they, they if they get somebody or they're fortunate enough to get somebody to, to uh, click on something, now they start harvesting your credentials, validating your accounts. Now they have access into your VPN if you have one of those. Uh, and then you use things like remote, remote uh, access Trojan or uh, remote uh, desktop protocol. So now they're basically taking over your computer system, even though you may not know it. Uh, most studies will say that they'll be they, the bad actors will be in your network from six to nine months uh, before you ever know anything about it. Uh, so while they're in there, they're infiltrating infiltrating sorry all these locks that you think about all of your data, all your servers, uh, all the things you may have on backups and storage. I mean, they're out doing those things, and then they're exfiltrating that data to to where they can keep it somewhere else in the event that you find out they're in there and you try to lock it down. They still have all your your data so they lock you down and then they're, then they're negotiating a ransom which takes us all the way to the right column there further they can take the information that they've exfiltrated and they can sell that to maybe other companies uh, or just threaten to damage your reputation by making the information public and then you look down and they say okay well what competitor might want to buy that kind of it or bad actor might want to buy that uh, for a resale value. So it builds into, what, builds into what Lacey was talking about in terms of an ecosystem. And they have three different ways here that they can monetize the information, your, your data, once they get in and get an opportunity to do what they do. Yeah. I think it's also pretty staggering, the average duration of an actual cyber incident. And I think this is surprising to most folks, but how long it actually takes um, from when the time when the attack begins, as opposed to you know when it's actually completely um, you know the network's back up and running. But it's 23 days. This is according to Coveware, their ransomware negotiation firm. Um, so 23 days that can obviously have a pretty devastating impact on not only the organization but the business income loss as well. So there's a lot of factors that um, can really adversely affect. So. I, you know, it's somewhat comical, but unfortunately, all too real. You know, a lot of times we have all these terrific cybersecurity tools, um, all these great things, but then you've got somebody who is just clicking or doing whatever they shouldn't be doing or going to websites or, um, you know, not really focusing on work or just not paying attention. And they can be one of your biggest vulnerabilities, obviously, your employees. So I um, have a few examples. Um, of some phishing attacks and what they look like. A lot of times, especially around tax time, we see a lot of W-2 scams. Um, you know, that's why it's always important to make sure that you're working with your employees on cybersecurity awareness and phishing training. Um, you know, here's another example. Obviously, you know, it's the, um, the from actually is a little bit off if you look at it. Um, and just, it all looks a little bit off, but you know, if somebody's not paying attention or if they just see, hey, I've got a UPS package, I wanna click on it, obviously that's not gonna be, um, uh, that could uh, inadvertently, uh, you know, expose your network to some sort of malware. So it's important to just make sure that you have employees that are thinking defensively, uh, sort of um, human firewall is really important. Um, you know, some real world examples that we've seen inadvertently replying all, so it doesn't even have to be malicious. It could just be information's been released and that could trigger um, a cyber liability or a cyber incident, um, especially because states have their own notification costs and things like that. Poor patching cadence. Unfortunately, we see this quite often where we've got vulnerabilities and they aren't being addressed and they're being exploited. Um, you know, snooping employees. I, 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 there was a um, cyber data breach that, um, that somebody told me about where it was an employee who was addicted to 
the lottery and they were pulling social security numbers of employees and using those um, and just, you know, calling someone in their numbers. Um, now that is something that could trigger a data breach. Uh, so you're just making sure that you're thinking about this and um, looking at all and all the employees understand what their responsibilities are from a privacy standpoint and um, not doing something silly like that that could really expose an organization. So I'm going to talk about cyber extortion specifically. And unfortunately, it's probably one of the biggest areas that we see. And uh, it's not a common to see something like this pop up on your screen um, or something like this where they, you know, typed in the notepad and they're going to direct you to, um, you know, paying some sort of extortion, giving you the directions, telling you what you should and shouldn't do, and then how they can be contacted, which is usually through Proton Mail. Um, so, you know, here's, this is definitely an example that we do see, um, unfortunately, and, you know, at this time, it's kind of panic for most organizations, because what do you do, who do you call? Um, so having these types of situations arise, especially because they're going to lock you out of your computer, typically these attacks begin on a Friday, and sometimes companies don't even realize it until Monday morning, and you're trying to just begin the work week, and obviously you're not able to do that just because of the the network so being down so here's just a situation um, this is a pretty typical bad actor exploiting a um, unpatched vulnerability and they are typically going to encrypt your network um, and they're also going to begin exfiltrating data as david mentioned about 77 percent of the incidents last year involved the exfiltration of data so even if you are able to restore from your backups are you comfortable with your information being released? Are you comfortable with personal emails, with financials being released? Um, a lot of times we're seeing them putting pressure on your vendors or your clients, actually calling them up and saying, are you comfortable with your information being released? Because so-and-so has been locked down. And um, this is unfortunately something that we are seeing that kind of public pressure. It's not uncommon for an extortion amount to begin at about $2 million worth of cryptocurrency really organizations of all sizes and um, there's certain ransomware negotiate there's certain ransomware gangs where that is their opening amount um, obviously there can be some negotiation but two million dollars is not atypical so um, you know these are some things to keep in mind and then the impact on your organization obviously is going to be the extortion demand so two million dollars um, do you have that those kind of funds how do you procure bitcoin um, how do you get your information back? That is restoration costs, um, hiring legal IT forensics and crisis management costs, and then the business income loss as well due to the downtime. So it can have pretty much, a, you know, it can have a staggering effect on the organization from all sides. Um, looks like we have a question. So do you have any information, statistics, et cetera, regarding organizations use of shared networks drives and its relationship to the risk and or impact of an actual um, attack? So. I'm assuming you mean something like a uh, share file, I would imagine, share file or something like that, or I'm not sure if you're referring to cloud providers. Um, Maybe Dropbox no. or Box. Yeah, so we've certainly seen, and there was a pretty, um, there was a pretty big incident last year with Excelion and it involved quite a few large organizations where they were using that file transfer service and they actually had an incident. Consequently, um, a lot of clients' information was, lead, uh, was released and it was a, some really large law firms um, internationally, some pharmacies, et cetera. So absolutely, there can be. Whenever you're entrusting your data to a third party, you're outsourcing the function, not necessarily the liability. And unfortunately, we've also seen, I've personally had some clients, many clients actually this year that have incidents that have arisen at a, um, you know, a data hosting facility and our client was ultimately affected. So, you know, it is absolutely something that can affect an organization. Lacey, John put in there that's local network drives on servers. I don't know if you had a chance to see that question pop up too. So he's yeah, not- Yeah, I just a, saw that second part. Yeah, he's not using a third party. I don't know if you have any statistics on where they're doing it on-premise as opposed to in the cloud? Uh, 
I have actually I do um, the recent IBM report that came out 2021 cost of a data breach. They actually had some information on that um, local versus cloud. You know, I think sometimes what I see is folks that have, um, you know, hosting and, and David, feel free to chime in on this. When you have um, information on your premises, um, are you making the investments into infrastructure? Is it the latest? Do you have all the right technologies? Because I don't think there's anything necessarily inherently wrong with outsourcing to professionals that focus on that space is selecting the right professionals. Um, but if you're handling it yourself, it's really making sure you have that expertise in house as well. Um, because unfortunately, we do see that especially, you know, um, with a half name incident with um, uh, Microsoft on premises, what we saw was a lot of folks just weren't investing into infrastructure. And as a result, they were vulnerable. Yeah, it's, if I were going to add there, I mean, I th you know, the best cybersecurity strategy, if you're doing it in-house, is one that incorporates multiple layers. I, I always give the house analogy, right, which is think in terms of a house. If it, you got to have a lock and then you're probably going to have deadbolts on all exterior doors, then you might have an alarm, you might have a dog, you might have alarm and or dog signs in your yard, motion sensor lights, video cameras. You might have a gun, whatever your tolerance and your budget is for those kinds of things where, where cybersecurity is not really much different. You're just you're just now instead of trying to protect your house, the perimeter is now your office, which is now even expanded further when you talk about all the people working out of their houses uh, and, and the flexible work environments. But cybersecurity, you're thinking about firewall, antivirus, make sure you have uh, updated software, firmware, patches, secure passwords, password manager. Uh, Two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Uh, you might have managed detection and response, vulner vulnerability scans, pen testing, encryption, backup, cybersecurity, insurance, and so on. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're doing more of those things and you're doing them correctly, uh, you're going to be more secure than if you were to maybe only be doing one or two of those things. Good question. So the other area that we're going to talk about too is, um, and this really kind of dovetails with the actual cyber incident is reputational harm and the incident response and that management. So, you know, after you have a ransomware incident, it's typically, um, you know, you're going to go through the information, what was compromised, what did they have access to, and then determine if notifications are required and what's necessary. Um, you know, if the media is involved, that may lead to some adverse um, type of exposure for an organization. So all these things combining, what we see is um, cost going up for the notification. Um, typically the IT forensics can be very expensive. Um, and then also what we see is the remediation can take time. Sometimes the devices themselves, like your servers or um, could even be printers, they could be corrupted to such a point where you actually have to completely replace the device too. Um, it's not uncommon and unfortunately we do see it. And then there's that consequential reputational harm. So if we have, um, um, you know, if, if you have a drop off in connectivity and then you have notification costs that are becoming public, you may see a drop off in business income, especially if you have a somewhat limited distribution, if you're business to business or something like that, it can have a pretty adverse effect on your organization. Um, if you do have an incident so that reputational harm and offsetting that business income loss can be, um, can be very important to an organization, obviously, because customer attrition can be devastating, especially if you have a limited um, number. I think we've. I thought we had another question. Sorry. Um, so cyber terrorism, uh, we hear. I hear this question come up quite a bit in network liability and cyber crime. So. Is cyber terrorism covered? If a nation state were to attack an organization, would that be covered or would that be considered an act of war? Um, you know, an act of war, for instance, is always excluded under a cyber liability policy, but there's affirmative coverage for cyber terrorism. So, um, you know, in this scenario, organizations hacked by a threat actor using phishing techniques that begin fraudulent payment instructions. So we got a couple of different things. We have access to data and access to the information, and then we have um, you know, theft of money, which falls under either crime or it could be cyber liability. So um, I think that Solar Winds is a good example of a nation state getting involved or um, an affiliated entity, at least uh, in the terms of, uh, of Solar Winds, where they actually, they infected and they exploited a vulnerability 
with SolarWinds. And then what they did provide IT management software. They then embedded malware. And then when there was a software update, they pushed that out to all the SolarWinds clients. So it was a huge kind of ripple effect. Um, and then we see, um, then we also see that kind of happen that we see it with Kaseya as well. So that's why managed service providers and managed service managed services security providers are becoming really challenging. They're also but, like yeah. a big target. Think about it. When they when they did the solar winds, they sent out the patch. Everybody that used solar winds at that point in time was now like a lead list, right? Think about for those people out there that do a lot of marketing, they buy lead lists and so forth. Okay, now we know that all these people that are solar winds customers, we know because we pushed out the updates. Now we know everybody else that we can go after. So that's why they become such a hot target. Yeah, and if you think about it, you get a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak. You affect one organization and then all their downstream clients. Like with Kaseya, um, it affected roughly 1,600 of their clients. So it's a really, it's a, it's a ripple effect, unfortunately. Um, but according to the IBM, or not the IBM, the FBI Internet Crimes Reports tracked these statistics. Um, it's about 4.1 billion. And that's actually reported incidents. Um, so a lot of this goes unreported, unfortunately. And the Department of Treasury recently came out with some, and, some guidance on paying the extortion, et cetera, and making sure that you are involving uh, law enforcement. And there's a lot of nuances to it, but there's um, there's a lot of implications and a lot of nuances to this. So I see one other question, is there seasonality with this? And unfortunately we do see this somewhat, I mean, solar winds happened um, in December last year. And we typically see an increase in incidents right before holiday weekends um, or on Fridays, but a lot of times at holiday weekends. So we had um, several incidents that were happening in July this year. So yes, there is unfortunately some opportunistics. They know that people are gonna be gone and maybe there's not gonna be as much um, visibility into the network as a result. Can we consider a pandemic a seasonality or a season? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say that's definitely <laughs> something that we could consider as well. And a we did huge see uptick in, huge uptick in cybercrime as a result of all the people in the distributed workforces. It's just harder for IT staffs to be able to lock down everybody when they're working out of their homes. I mean, their home app networks, you have executives sharing the same network of kids. They don't know how to partition things off. Kids are usually going to be, I, I can't always blame them, but they're usually going to be a little more click ha happy, right? So there's not the same kind of discretion that you might have. And then before you know it, they're clicking on this and that and executives are running reports or financials and they become just uh, an easy target. So the pandemic has definitely made it more difficult, but I kid about it being a season. If it is, yeah. I hope it's almost over. And last year too, I think I might have this number in one of my, in one of the subsequent slides, but last year, according to the IBM report, they're in roughly when, when there was a remote incident, it cost almost a million dollars more to remediate. And it takes almost 58 days longer to um, actually remediate as well. So it's just there's also just a lag time um, in handling and remediating incidents when it's a pandemic or when it's a remote working type of incident. Along those so, lines, I, I was moderating uh, another panel that had Nicole Beckwith. She used to work for, I think, for the FBI and law enforcement. She's now in cybersecurity with uh, Kroger. Just wicked smart. And she said the gold standard for, for cybersecurity is one minute to detect, 10 minutes to respond, and 60 minutes to remediate. Because if you think about it, it's not only the amount. Once they lock your stuff down, then it's also, okay, if you pay the ransom or whatever it is and you finally get access to your data back, how long does it take you to get that data back? Are you getting it from backup somewhere else? If there's large amounts of data, how long does that take and how long is it going to end up disrupting your business? So it really is, you know, it, there's just not a lot of time to act, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, before we get into the next part, there's another question. So is the attack trend particular to commercial organizations or is there an impact to nonprofits as well? any percentage breakdown of commercial attacks versus nonprofit attacks. Um, I think at the, I think it just really honestly, it depends on the type of data that you hold and also your just your vulnerability really um, 
a lot of times these are opportunistic situations. They're just scanning the internet, looking for known vulnerabilities, open ports, things like that, easy ways to access the network. If you don't have multi-factor authentication, it's just gonna make it that much easier for them. So um, unfortunately, nonprofits are not immune. Healthcare entities are not immune either. So, and then if you're a nonprofit that uses healthcare information, it's almost twice as bad, especially because the healthcare information is about 10 times more valuable than credit card data. So um, I do have some data if you're interested um, in reaching out to me afterwards. I've got um, some statistics, but it's um, fairly agnostic. Unfortunately, these types of bad actors are, these bad actors are fairly agnostic. So they're going to go after organizations of all sizes as well. It doesn't really matter how, how large you are. Um, you know, if they can exploit a vulnerability, they will. I mean, I think that goes back for those people that remember when Target got hacked, it wasn't coming into Target directly. It was actually a contractor. So think of, and I don't know if it was an individual or a company, but it, it was a contractor. So think of it as, as a smaller outfit. They got in and infiltrated the the, the contractor and then they uh, the, the contractor had access into Target systems. And before you know it, via the contractor, now all of a sudden they, they're in a target and they're doing their deal. So it doesn't necessarily, it, they may not even be after the nonprofit or the original organization where they got in. They just sit back for that six to nine months that I talked about before and found it like, where's the most money? How do I monetize this the, much, the most? It really is just that simple. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So um, the next part, something that is coming up quite a bit. Um, it's really around access control. And one of those factors is multi-factor authentication within that. Uh, this is probably the most common reason that my clients are not able to renew their cyber liability coverage or obtain cyber liability coverage right now. So um, I'm gonna talk briefly about what multi-factor authentication is. Um, obviously it's something you have and something you know, essentially. So, um, Computer's just lagging here a little bit. So there's different types of multi-factor authentication. So it could be a password, or passphrase, um, a token or smart card, or it could be a biometric as well. Um, you know, I think most of us are pretty familiar with a password and then also maybe text message verification with a code or an authenticating application. Um, authenticating applications are gonna be much safer than um, text messaging if you're going to implement that, but you know, having multi-factor authentication certainly is better than nothing. So having text messages is gonna be better than just relying on passwords. Um, unfortunately, you know, credential reuse is such a huge issue. And a lot of employees will use um, the same password that they use when they're online shopping as they do when they are with their, you know, their work email. And if that online shopper, or that online retailer is compromised and they have that password, they're gonna do credential stuffing, things like that, where they're gonna be able to determine and be able to log in to your company email. So that's why multi-factor authentication is really important. And, or if they get a phishing email and it says Microsoft Office, you know, please sign in your credentials. And um, so we can verify that it really is you. They put that information in, they now have not only username and password, but maybe other um, confidential information. And they're able to log in from outside the network. So where should you use MFA? Remote access is obviously really critical um, to email. So if, you're, if your employees are able to access email on a non-corporate device or through a web app, it's really vital that you use multi-factor authentication. A lot of times, depending on your licensing with Office 365, it can be concluded or you may already have these capabilities. So it's important to understand what you can turn on understanding that you're probably going to get pushback from employees, maybe even executives, but it's really doing what's best for the organization. And when I talk to clients now, especially when you think about it in terms of multi-factor authentication and email um, and obtaining insurance, think about it in terms of, I have a building and I need to insure that building. And perhaps it's a wood building or something where it's, you're, you're farther away from a fire department. Sprinklers are critical. It may prevent you from getting insurance. Um, same thing if you're in like a floodplain or something like that. Having these precautions in place is going to allow you to get insurance. Um, same thing with multi-factor authentication it is really becoming something where it's a non-starter if you don't have it. 
So having that multi-factor authentication is really critical for email. It's also really critical for privileged users. Um, oftentimes I see this missed. So this would be anyone that has enhanced or administrative rights within the organization. It's also important that you don't have any shared accounts as well. So we have multiple people that are using the same network administrative email account or something like that. So there should be essentially two different types of um, emails being used. There should be you know, your normal kind of day-to-day um, -day operations and then also your privileged accounts as well. And then for those privileged accounts, even within your own trusted network, there should be um, multi-factor authentication being utilized for that as well. This is going to prevent them from, you know, if they are um, have gained access, this is going to prevent them from being able to move laterally, you know, turn off uh, firewalls, turn off antivirus, things like that. Last, uh, well, not quite last, there's probably another one that I need to add for the next time, but remote access to your network. So hopefully you're using a VPN. Um, and then if you are connecting outside, which uh, obviously in this hybrid remote work environment that many of us have, or fully remote, there should be some sort of multi-factor authentication for that as well. Uh, we're also starting to see where um, carriers are also requiring core applications as well. So one thing, um, you know, how many boxes can your organization check? So this is coming up and these carriers are asking these questions, partly because we are getting into situations where um, the our clients have, you know, last year they said they were going to implement email or privilege access or remote access. And unfortunately it has come and it's gone and they've had a claim or something has happened. And as a result, carriers are asking these questions. And if we don't have yes answers to multi-factor authentication, it's um, it's making it nearly impossible to obtain insurance for our clients. And the reason being that roughly 90 some percent of the claims that we saw last year, our clients didn't have multi-factor authentication. So it's just kind of one of those basic things that um, carriers are expecting clients to have, core applications being another that we're starting to see. So it is important um, to have that in place. Uh, employee security awareness training should be doing at least monthly. And there's a lot of great products out there. It's not a terribly expensive tool. Um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of vendors, um, no before co -fence. Um, I think Mimecast has a product, TechGuard. There's tons of them out there. Uh, so it's making sure that you're testing your employees, that they're thinking defensively, that they're um, not just clicking on things. And then there's additional training if they do. Uh, I mentioned this before, but enforcing the use of dedicated accounts for privileged access and administrative access no shared accounts. Uh, so, you know, again, that's going back to bad cyber hygiene and really kind of focusing on those best practices to make sure that the organization is being best protected. Um, so pre preparation's really critical right now. And one of the things I'm starting to talk to my clients, I mean, we're starting to talk about our July renewals. Um, what are your controls? What are you doing? How are we gonna prepare for this? Um, so I've talked quite a bit about multi-factor authentication. There's a lot of questions around encryption, specifically of backups. So are they encrypted? Are you also using some sort of, um, are they uh, offline? Some sort of, um, uh, yeah, there, there needs to be some sort of segmentation between the network and your backups. Because if your network's affected, they can jump to your backups and compromise them. So, or if you're using some cloud service and it's immutable backups as well. So think about it in those terms, encryption is really critical. Lacey, I'll, I might add something real quick right there. Um, mm -hmm. On the backups, a lot of times what the bad actors will do is they'll target your backups first. So once they're in your network, they'll actually lock down your backups and then they'll lock down the data in your network. You might ask why? Well, if you have the backups and they're up to date, you may just tell the bad actor, I'm not going to pay any ransom, go, you know, go fly a kite, go chase somebody else, knowing that you have your own your own backups. But if the backups are locked up and you can't do that, then you're much more apt in order to pay the ransom that they're looking for. So a lot of times they will. And that's why it's nice. Again, when you talk about two factor authentication, it's the same kind of thing like your backups. Don't do your backups on site. Have a third party where you do your backups. Right. So you have that segmentation. Otherwise, you're just leaving yourself more vulnerable. And it's also important to know what's your recovery time objective. <clears throat> I've had several organizations say, 
It's going to take us three days to restore from our backups. So have those questions, have those conversations with your IT team, understand what those ramifications are. I know if you're a really, really large organization, um, I've heard it could take up to a week. <clears throat> it's like trying to turn a battleship, right? So making sure that you understand if we do need to fully restore from backups, how long is that going to take? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to risk tolerance. What's your tolerance? How long can you be without it? What does it cost you per hour or per day uh, when you can't operate as usual? And then you got to budget in, whether it's your premiums for your insurance or your other cybersecurity products that you need to buy in order to you know, have a layered strategy. Either way, you got to be able to, it's, it, it can come down to somewhat of a simple math equation in terms of what the business loses. But what you don't, what's much harder to put a number on is what happens when you, if you were to get hacked and it become public or the information become public, what does that do to your reputation? Because they say, what is it like 60% or 90, 60% of the businesses will go bankrupt within six months. You know, most people just can't afford to take the hit, not only from paying money out, but the lost business or the lost customers or the loss of their own reputation. I know it sounds like we're selling like, like smoke here, but the stuff is, I mean, just read, it's happening all the time. It's not a matter of creating any fear, uncertainty, or doubt here. It's all around us. Yeah, and I think just to give a sense of where the insurance market is right now, there's um, there's approximately, so Fitch ratings from 2015 to 2019, the average loss ratio for cyber liability insurance was about 43%. So it's pretty manageable. Um, it wasn't uncommon for the cost of, or the extortion demand to be $50,000 then. And now we're seeing beginning demands of $2 million. So you can see the huge jump that we saw, primarily because they're compromising backups um, and you're not able to recover. And um, when in 2020, we saw that increase from 43% to 73%. I suspect that 2021 will be substantially higher. So the carriers are paying a huge numbers out in cyber liability claims. And as a result, they are starting to push down these best practices because this is what they have seen from their claims. As a result, they're saying, here's some non-starters for us. You need to have your backups encrypted. You need to have multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, you need to be training your employees. These are all the basic things that they're pressing, they're pushing back on because they're seeing these claims in this space. Um, you know, I think it's also really important, and, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because we're going to have a subsequent um, part on specifically on just incident response and disaster recovery plans. But, you know, have an incident response plan. Understand who needs to be contacted. If you are down, how do you contact your employees? Um, these are all pretty basic, but having a tabletop exercise and walking through it is really going to um, help you understand how ready you may potentially be for an incident. You know, think about it. We have fire drills for a reason. It's practice. It's muscle memory. You should be doing the same thing for, you know, incident response, not only necessarily from a cyber incident, but some other kind of disaster as well. Um, I know it sounds very basic, but use caution while um, transferring any kind of funds. Social engineering fraud um, is still something that's very prevalent where we have a third party manipulating someone within the organization purporting to be um, either a vendor or it could be a client or it could be another employee to transfer um, money. Obviously, they're trying to monetize this. The, it, you know, it sounds like you should be able to catch most of them. It happens. It happens to large, sophisticated organizations all the time. And some other, so here's some additional kind of checks uh, that I just wanna run through. So continuous network scanning and patch management. Um, the carriers are actively using scanning technology now as part of the underwriting process. So they can see if you have patches that have not been addressed, any critical vulnerability exposed to the, um, to the internet, they can see open ports and they're declining my clients because of these. Um, we already talked about um, backups, but you know that multi-layered approach, um, making sure that access, access control is locked down. If you can have them air gapped from your network, um, you know these are all really important. And then encryption. I and mean, I talked about encrypting your backups, so they also want to see the um, data being encrypted both at rest within your network and then as it's being trans, um, transmitted as well. And then endpoint detection and response. Um, they want to see those and the carriers are starting to ask who are, who's your provider? 
they want to see the leading providers. <laughs> you know, ideally they want to see Carbon Black. They want to see CrowdStrike. They want to see these, um, you know, these leading vendors in this space. And they know that they have that, um, the really the sophistication to block. And the endpoint detection and response, it's um, also called next generation antivirus. It's essentially on all of your, hopefully deployed on all of your endpoints. So uh, laptops, anytime, anything that has any kind of connectivity. And then it's artificial intelligence where it can um, detect and isolate and happen in real time as well. So not just necessarily waiting on a person to come and address it. Uh, back to that, timing is really critical and, and immediately remediating is really imperative. So we're also seeing too, a lot of questions around end of life technology or loss of technical support. And unfortunately with, clients who are in manufacturing, or maybe if you're in a nonprofit and you know, maybe budgets are tight and you're kind of making things work with some technology, it's, um, it is really important to keep making those investments into um, newer technology so you have those protections in place. If you don't have that, what are your compensating controls? Um, you know, is there some sort of segmentation or segregation from the rest of the network? And then they also want to know what's your time frame for sunsetting the technology as well. This is really critical. Um, and the carriers are asking a lot of questions around that because we're seeing a lot of vulnerabilities, especially with manufacturing. If you have these devices and um, maybe your operational technology has some sort of connectivity and they're able to migrate, they compromise the devices, um, you know, it could really disrupt your manufacturing process. Um, you know, I've heard of clients being down certain parts of their production being down for, you know, six months after an incident, because they had some sort of specialized machine that was corrupted to such a point. And, um, you know, it was almost impossible to fix it because it was um, such an old machine. So these are all really important factors to consider. Vulnerability management is really critical too. So David talked about penetration testing should be something that you should be doing, hopefully at the minimum yearly. Um, but whenever you have any network change, that should be also taken into consideration. And there's different ways of handling penetration testing. It can be internal. Um, it could be external penetration testing. It could also be, um, you know, phishing type. So someone with the, um, you know, doing research on you through LinkedIn, specifically targeting, or it could be um, someone actually doing a physical penetration test, see if they can get on site how far into the building, et cetera. Do they have access to um, you know, workstations? Can they sit down? What can they do? Um, compromise assessments being done regularly by a third party. And I don't think it's a bad idea to also rotate those third parties as well. Email scanning and filtering. It sounds really basic, but we have a lot of clients that aren't utilizing this as well. So, this is a pretty comprehensive list, but um, sort of minimum protection, stronger, and then best protections as well. So these are all things that the carriers want to see. And as a result, I mean, it, it's a pretty exhaustive list, but you know, it's just making sure that you're kind of trying to prioritize and addressing things um, that you think are the most sensitive. And you know, think about things in terms of what's your most critical data within your organization? What are your crown jewels that you need to protect? And then layered security around that. Um, but really multi-factor authentication. If you take nothing else away from this webinar, um, having it and utilizing it across your entire network is absolutely critical. The other and thing, then, if you could stay on, could you go back to that slide real quick, Lacey, your previous slide there, thank you. Yeah. The other thing, I mean, this if you're a small business and you have one person in your IT department or maybe two, or maybe you don't have any, like you can choose partners, you can outsource a lot of this stuff in order to be able to check a lot of these boxes. It's not like something that all of a sudden you find like, how am I going to become an expert? What do I know? I mean, it's confusing as heck. I mean, we're dealing with very large organizations that are still grappling with the with with, with the thought of which one of these things am I going to do? I can't get to all these things. We don't have the people. Maybe we don't have the budget or what have you. So at the end of the day, everyone needs to know if you don't have people and maybe even if you do have some small teams that there are people out there that are more than willing to help you in these spaces. And at the end of the day, when you get some more assistance in this, you get some more of these layers of technology strategy uh, implemented, then you're going to be in a much better position to get the cyber security insurance to augment 
uh, your safety in terms of anything bad were to happen. So you decrease your odds of something happening. You increase your odds of getting some uh, a policy or coverage in the cyber world. And then on top of it, if you were to have something, you're going to be able to get your data back. You're going to be able to minimize any ransom. Uh, and you're also going to be able to utilize the, the cybersecurity and policy that you have in place because you've done many more of the right things. Is anybody going to do all of these? You're probably going to have to be a pretty big, large organization to do all these things. Yeah. I just know when I look at that list of, even as a small business owner, I'm looking at it going, oh my gosh, we don't even do all those things. Holy crow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, this is a pretty comprehensive list. I don't think anyone's expecting an organization to do every single one, unless you're a pretty big organization. Right. Um, and there is those expectations. But, you know, following a framework, a cybersecurity framework of some sort is, um, will help you kind of prioritize as well. And then also understanding if you're in certain industry classes, should you be following that as well? Um, you know, that's going to help provide some guidance for you as well. And um, I know one question that came up is what kind of resources would an insurance carrier provide? And that is something that is really quite interesting. The carriers are starting to focus. Um, they're providing the assessments. So we have some carriers, if they're declining you, they're providing an assessment and telling you exactly why they're declining. Maybe you have um, an RDP port exposed. Perhaps you have um, you know, too, many, um, too many vulnerable, unpatched um, programs. So these are all things that they're considering and they're reviewing. So that's part of just the underwriting process. Going through an application is really going to help you identify perhaps some of the areas that you need to focus on. Um, but some of the carriers have partnerships with password manager applications. Um, I utilize one of those. I can't say enough good things about them with multi-factor authentication protecting them. But using a password manager application is going to have that human factor taken out of the equation where um, you know, we're creatures of habit. It's hard to remember these large complex passwords. So if you're using a password manager, you only have to remember one password and then you have access to all of yours. So um, some of them have those complementary where you have pa password manager applications. There's also some that have partnerships with endpoint detection and response providers where you get a huge discount, almost 80% with some of these really large leading providers. Um, you know, privileged access management tools are really something that the carriers want to see as well. Some of the carriers have partnerships with um, some of the leading providers like CyberArk, where you can get their products at a discount. Um, there's discounts with multi-factor authentication providers as well, like RSA Secure ID. There's email threat prevention tools. Um, you know, you kind of name it, the carriers are trying to align with those providers because they want their clients to have the best controls possible and hopefully they avoid having a loss. So, um, you know, taking a look at what's included with your cyber liability policy is really important because you may be able to offset some of your cybersecurity spend um, by utilizing one of these tools. I don't know, David, if you had anything you wanted to add. I was going to just add, you know, when, when you were when you were talking, or it was earlier in the presentation, and I just Googled real quick, how long does it take to hack a six-digit password? And Google comes back and says, according to this calculations, green is some, I, don't, I didn't go into the article, but it says, uh, estimates a six digit passcode takes up to 22.2 hours to break while processing an eight digit code can take as few as 46 hours or up to 92 days. And if you take that up to a 10 digit passcode, they're saying on average, it's gonna take about 12 years to hack or maybe as much as 25. So when you think about the most basic thing, I mean, I know we're talking about applying for cybersecurity insurance, but it's, if we just go to the most basic, keeping yourself safe, it starts with a password, right? Don't use the same password for multiple things. Use different passwords. Make sure, I don't think I have any, I use a password manager, like Lacey said. Uh, one of the providers in our portfolio is LastPass. We've, I've been using them for years, and then we implemented them as an enterprise, which is pretty cool because you can have it. You can use the password manager to manage portals that the whole company would use and you have enterprise and then each individual person can have their own individual uh, LastPass accounts to take care of their more personal stuff, right? But at the end of the day, I don't think I have any password that's not less than 12 characters. You got to have uppercase, lowercase, you got to have numbers, you got to have special characters. Okay, you have that. Then you have a password manager. Then you have uh, multi-factor authentication. And you just keep building from there and you just create a safer and safer environment. I mean, if you make it difficult enough, like 
I had a police officer, a good friend used to always say, hey, Dave, if you light up your house outside and your neighbor doesn't, which which do you think they're going to go after? Unless they've been casing you and your family in your house, they're going to go after the one for easier access. So just make it tougher. You know, what do they say in the jungle? You don't have to be the you don't have to be the fastest gazelle. Just don't just don't be the slowest. Yep. They don't have to stab up around the bear. Um, so another question came up. Is there information available relative to the use of Google Doc Sheets and the new organization's vulnerability to attack? Um, I don't know anything specifically, David. I don't know if you have anything, but I think you know. There's, I think Google is an organization that has a lot of cybersecurity structured into it. But just like anything else, if you're sharing passwords or if you're not protecting the information. Um, also, the way that you have it configured to your, how your organization accesses, that can be problematic as well. And then not working off the latest versions or having an out-of-date um, you know, operating system can be challenging. But I don't have any data specifically about Google Docs. Oh, I was on mute there. Sorry. I, I don't have anything specific on Google Docs either. Um, okay. I have mixed opinions on Google in general. They collect a lot of data, so yeah. I don't. I don't know. That I would be speaking from maybe a personal opinion there, as opposed to statistical data. So I'll pass. Yeah, and um, you know, if you'd like to reach out to me afterwards, we have a collaboration too with the vendor to provide um, security posture assessment. So if it's something that you're interested in and exploring that. Um, they're all 20 plus year CISOs and they usually have a lot of good insights. So let me know if you're interested in having those conversations. Um, and then the other question, you mentioned a lack of cyber resources on staff. Is MDR a means to satisfy EDR um, protection without the staffing requirements? So manage, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the MDR. Yeah, I think if you look here on EDR here, you have in endpoint detection and response. But again, now you're taking the onus on yourself. Think of it being more of a premise-based solution that you have to monitor, you have to manage, and so on and so forth, as opposed to MDR, where you use a third party, an outsourced source cybersecurity company that's going to be able to provide those resources. And you think about one of the things that you'll find, I think people will find when they get into this deeper is the number of alerts. You can get, you can put some of these things in place and get alert fatigue. I mean, completely worn out with chasing all the alerts. But at the end of the day, you, you don't have time or resources to, ch to chase them all. What you need to know are what are the ones that are most mission critical. And there's often, well, not often, we found that many of the providers out there that offer these kind of these these, these outsourced products are going to augment and sometimes eclipse any kind of staff that you might have. They're going to be better at chasing down the alerts. They're going to be better at managing which ones are the most critical. Uh, they're going to see this stuff on a wide scale basis, not just specific to your network, but specific to what's going on in the country, specific to what's going on in the world. So they're going to be much more apt to do it. So I, I'm not looking at the question right now, but that'd be the difference between endpoint detection response and manage. You would actually be buying into the managed part of it as well. And Same kind of tools, be, just some more people yeah. assistance. Yeah, and sometimes that can be a little bit more economical for smaller organizations to outsource that. Um, can be less than the cost of hiring an IT or a cybersecurity professional, which is very specialized and also very expensive. These cyber, um, good cybersecurity folks now are jumping ship. A lot of them every two years and seeing 20 to, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 dollar bumps in income. I mean, they're regularly making anywhere from 80 to I mean, 80 would be like a cheap cybersecurity specialist. They're just there's a high demand and low supply. So there's a shortage in there for uh, they can kind of write their own ticket to a certain degree. Yeah. And um, this slide, I think, um, David, you wanted to talk about this specifically because it's just a third party verifying that these are all things that the organization should be doing. Yeah, I think for those people that don't know, this is uh, Gartner. Gartner is probably the most well-known uh, IT research company in the world. They do a lot of research on a lot of different things and they talk to clients, they talk to vendors, and they, 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 uh, they predict trends and estimate numbers and metrics and so forth. They're, they're just world renowned. And if you could, you blow this up a little bit, uh, Lacey, if you can't, I can share because I already have it blown up here. Well, um, I think I think we just kind of wanted to talk about with this slide, the focus on obviously security. You can see how heavily weighted that quadrant is. So 
I mean, I think we kind of want to probably not get into all the minutia of this one, but more, this is a third party that's really verifying. These are the things, everything that we've been talking about, how important it is for all organizations to really follow in order to have kind of the best cyber hygiene. I think that was the point of showing this. You know, well, I mean, if you were just looking at it from a high level, the smaller the circle, the less the, the less the value, the bigger the circle, the bigger the value. And just like a stoplight, red means stop, you know, or, or critical and yellow is caution and green means go or, or less risk associated with deploying those things. So just look at all the big circles in that security quadrant in the upper right, like in the 12 to two o'clock range of this, this pie chart. I mean, like what are there? One, two, three, like six, half of them or so are in that enterprise value, huge enterprise value. And some of them have some huge risk and some of them are, are lower risk, but I think it speaks to the, criticality of having a uh, good cyber hygiene on a go forward basis. This is not going to yeah. become a smaller issue. This is only going to become a bigger issue. Yeah. And I think um, we're going to be sending out some, some information afterwards and we can include this as well for anyone who wants to kind of review this more in depth as well. So I'll briefly talk, I mean, I, I think I've been talking about some of the things that we're seeing reverse underwriting, um, et cetera, but we're starting to see some of the carriers also utilizing um, co-insurance. So anywhere up to 50%. So client could be responsible for 50% of a loss. So um, it's becoming pretty, um, pretty onerous on the policy holder if your controls aren't good enough. And we're also seeing pretty substantial rate increases, 40 to 100 plus percent. I've had some situations where it's 200, 300% increases. And a lot of times it is uh, really based on your controls, really driving what kind of um, outcome you get. So if you've been investing into cybersecurity, chances are your renewal terms are gonna reflect that or your, when you obtain insurance. We're starting to see new exclusions like end of life exclusions. Um, we're starting to see software um, some um, copyright and music type of claims as well because we're starting to see more of an increase in that space sublimiting cyber extortion um, it's being one of the biggest loss leaders so if your controls aren't where they need to be they may be limiting your third your first party and then the dependent business interruption we talked about supply chain issues with kaseya um, solar winds those downstream providers that affect your organization if they are down because of an incident we're starting to see a lot of scrutiny around supply chain as well and we're going to talk about this more in depth in some subsequent um, uh, series. But you know, cyber liability again, it is just first party and third party, and um, protecting the organization and losses and expenses. But I think just to summarize, cyber insurance is an important element for any kind of organization's um, really financial resiliency, cyber resiliency. Um, so having that, but. You know, as we talk through this this morning, we I didn't really talk too much about insurance. It's more, what are you doing to make sure your organization is protected as possible? And then if you need to, and if you have that situation that um, is going to be pretty devastating to any organization, that you can transfer that risk and become more uh, resilient as a result. So making sure that you have all of those things up front is really going to lead to a better result with regards to your cyber insurance terms and conditions, and then also making your organization uh, more resilient at the end. So I don't know if there's any additional questions or anything that um, anyone wanted to specifically discuss before we wrap up. I know we only have about two minutes and I wanna be sensitive to everyone's time. All right. Looks like Louie has one here, Rex. You mentioned, uh, Lacey, I'm sorry. You you mentioned a lack of cyber resources on staff. Is MDR a means to satisfy EDR protection without the staffing requirements? Well, that's like a softball question, I think. Yes, that's exactly what it is. MDR is giving you those additional resources uh, to, to help with the protection that the technology. So you have both technology and people, right? And you need both. The, the technology only goes so far, so you need the uh, the, the people and the experts in order to take that technology and make make it meaningful so that you can make meaningful adjustments to your cybersecurity posture or strategy or environment, atmosphere, what have you. Good question, Louis. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for your time. And uh, we'll be 
having the next invitation coming out for the second part in the series. And um, there's a total of four. So we're going to be really focusing on that incident response and disaster recovery component um, next time. And um, we'll have some other expertise on the call just to add some additional color to, um, to this important topic. So thank you. Wow, in this, in this season of Halloween scariness, this might be the scariest thing that we're gonna see. The bad actor costume is one that none of us wanna experience coming to our door this holiday season or going forward. I wanna extend a special thank you to our presenters and partners, Lacey and David, for their expertise and time today. The, pres the presentation is definitely a wake up call. And as Lacey indicated, we'll be sending out follow-up information with some additional assets to help you assess your current cybersecurity risks and solutions, as well as information on the next three sessions of the series. Please make sure you get registered for these informative events. As much information as we have heard today, just think we've only tip, touched the tip of the iceberg. It's scary to think what's lurking under the water. If you have further questions or want to learn more about programs at the Chamber, please reach out to me at tdeer at cincinnatichamber.com. But please don't do that for at least an hour because I'm going to be changing some, or should I say, a bunch of my passwords. Thank you all for attending today, and thank you for your partnerships. Have a great week.